Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're always with us. We thank you uh, just for all that you're doing in our lives, God. You are always so faithful and so good. We thank you that you have brought us all here together. You have brought us all into, into unity uh, with, with each other uh, through you and in you. Uh, we, just, we just pray, Lord, that you would just bless this message. You would bless our time uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever watched like one of those animal documentaries like nature, like Animal Planet, right? Or like Planet Earth. And um, you see, they always like tell the stories, you know, of like the lions that are hunting or like the pack of wolves, right? And they're going after the zebras or the gazelles or the wolves are going after like bison or things like that. And um, what always happens, right? They like scare, they get the animals moving and it's the, the herd, the, the let's, let's use zebras. We'll use zebras for my example. The zebras that are either the young ones, the old ones, or the injured, it's the ones that can't keep up with the pack, the ones that get separated are the ones that get devoured, right? They get drugged down and ripped to shreds and you're like, oh, that's so gross, but you can't stop watching. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and, and they devour. And then, and then likewise, you also have, you know, you see these predators, these lions, these wolves, or whatnot, will go after bigger animals, right? If they get, like, an elephant alone, they can take down an elephant. Or you see wolves being able to take down, like, a moose or a bison. Something that, that by themselves, they would have no, no ability. But together they have the power to, to do it, right? So you have this idea of unity, right? You're, we're stronger together. The pack survives, right? If, if you're within your, your group of zebras and you're sticking with them, then the lions aren't gonna be able to get you. But then all of a sudden, if you have a challenge in your life Say so you, got, you got a big moose over here that you need to take out. Well, if you're in your pack and you have your together, you can take out the moose. So there's power in unity. And that's, that's what I want to I wanna talk about this morning is, is the power of unity. And what is unity? Why is it important? What does it look like? And I want to preface this that some of my message, there, there are moments that might feel a little heavy and a little weighty maybe and at first I was like oh like maybe I should apologize because I don't want it to come across like I'm like oh we need to do this but I was like no I'm not going to apologize because this message is vital to the church this message of of unity is literally like the life force of of the church we need unity we cannot survive without unity and so I'm not going to apologize if it feels weighty or if you're like, oh, no, that's aimed at me. And it wasn't, but that's Holy Spirit telling you to shape up. Let's go. So what is unity? Right. I would say biblically unity is recognizing and uh, realizing that we are now all one in Christ. Right. right? It's, it's in its simplest form. Right. It is, is that reality that we are one in Christ. We see Constantly throughout the epistles and the New Testament, it is, we are now one in Christ. You're one in Christ. We're in him, right? We are now members of one body. It is about this union that we now have in Jesus, right? We've been, we've been united with him, and that's, that's, no, we have this common value, this common um, thing, and, and it's Jesus. It's, hey, we can have some differences, we can do this, but we have Jesus, Let's go after Jesus. And the beauty of unity, the beauty of unity is that you have to have diversity to have unity. When there's no diversity, it becomes uniformity. Now, uniformity, those, unity and uniformity are two different things, right? Uniformity is we all dress the same, we all talk the same, we're all drinking the same Kool-Aid, right? Right? Which is what a lot of today's culture wants. 
I'm going to push this back just a little because I keep feeling I'm going to bump it as I'm walking up the front. And I'm like, either this is going to tip or I'm going to tip. <laughs> and unless that's my faith moment to step out and just <laughs> levitate. Uh, <laughs> do it. <laughs> What's my workers comp like? You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> unity, unity requires diversity because unity allows me to come in and say, hey, you know what? I might not have the same political ideologies of you as you. I might have some different theological beliefs. I might um, like a different sports team. I'm not a vegan. I'm not, you know, I also in these things that, that the world loves to bring division in, it says, hey, we can still have that division, but I can still be unified with you. I can still be in unity with you because it's not about my political beliefs. It's not about what I like and what I don't like. It's about Jesus. I'm found in union in Jesus. So diversity is beautiful and it's needed and, and it's required. So why is unity important? Did you know that unity actually commands the blessing of the Lord? Psalm 133, I think it's my first scripture that I have back there. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there... The there it's referring to isn't the Mount Hermon. The there is in unity. For there, the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. God's blessing rests on unity. Where there's unity, there's life. Right? It's why a house divided can't stand. There's life. Where there's unity, there is abundance. Where there's unity, there is prosperity. Where there's unity, there's peace, love, and joy. He came to bring life and life more abundant. God is attracted to unity. And we see this. We see this. We'll start in Genesis 11, which I have for, that's the next next scripture, right? So, at one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. And as the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. And they began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. And then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united. And they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. They won't be able to understand each other. And in that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is what the city was called. That's why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. And in this way, he scattered them all over the world. So the Lord was attracted to their unity. He said, oh, they have all gathered together. They're united in a common purpose and goal, but their hearts and their unity, he didn't like. He says, their heart's off. They're they're trying to obtain and become like me. They're trying to build a tower into the heavens. They're trying to show off their ego. It's not directed at me. It's directed at them. I have to bring in disunity. I'm going to confuse, you know, change the language, confuse them, and they spread out their certain ways. But it was the unity that attracted him. We then go to Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared above them, and a tongue rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as as the Spirit gave them ability. They were united, right? They were all packed into one Honda Accord. I had to add in the accord joke. I couldn't not. <laughs> <They were> not <laughs> right. 
how 120 of them all fit into that little vehicle, I don't know. That's a sign, wonder, and miracle for the Lord to reveal to us one day. No, they're all, they're all in this room, right? And it's, we know 120. There's most likely was more because they didn't always count the women and the children. And so there's, there's a lot going on in this room. And they were all unified in their purpose, in their vision, in their, we're coming after God, right? Jesus told them, hey, pray, the Holy Spirit's coming. Pray and, and wait. And so they're like, okay, God, that's what we're going to do. We're going to pray and wait. And they're unified. And the Lord says, I like unity. I like this. And so he comes. And what happens? Isn't it so interesting? It parallels the, the Tower of Babel. He comes and he gives them different languages. Except this time it didn't cause disunity. It actually brought more unity because all of a sudden, it's, if you continue reading, all the people that are out and about, they hear their language speaking. It's, there's like 12 different languages that are being spoken. And they're all like, Oh, that's my language. So it's, how is he speaking that? And he's preaching the gospel. And you have 3,000 people get saved. So all of a sudden, when we find that our hearts, right, are unified together and unified in a way that is for good, that is for God, it actually brings more unity. Right? He comes because the Lord is attracted to it. And we continue to see that throughout the book of Acts, right? It says that the church was, they were of one heart and one soul. They continued to walk in unity together. Why is it important? Why is unity important? Because Jesus prayed for it. That's my second point. That's usually a pretty good sign that something is important when Jesus says, hey, Father, I want this. Right? And so we see in John 17, Starting in verse 20, it says, I ask not only on behalf of these, speaking of his disciples, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their word, that's you guys, that they may all be one. As you, Father, in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me, or have well, a little bit and have loved them even as you have loved me All right so Jesus' prayer to the father is lord god let them be one let them walk in unity just as we have walked in unity let them do the same let them realize that not only are we in union with them but they are in union together because what's the fruit of it what's the fruit of unity blessing. there's blessing but he says he says oh he says he says so that the world so that the world may know me so that the world would believe in me You want to know the secret sauce to evangelism? You want to know the, the secret to a global harvest and a revival and all the things that we're crying out for and praying for? It's unity. Plain and simple. And it's a little uncomfortable, right? Like, oh, man, I wish there was something else. <laughs> no, no, no. I wish, I wish it could be something different. But it's it. It's It's unity. It's literally Jesus' prayer is, hey, let them be one. Let them know that they're one so that the world will know. Wow. Right. And yet we're so, you know, like, hey, man, we just got to go. We got to go hit the streets. We got to go. We got to go preach the gospel. We got to go get everyone saved. Meanwhile, we're tearing down our brothers and our sisters and this is the part that really saddens me. And this is the part that I feel heavy with. It's our ch- ch- the church, not our church. Our church is amazing. But does the is amazing. The church as a whole, the universal church, is full of canes. Wow. What do I mean by they're full of canes? We are way too quick to, to murder our brother. We're way too quick to tear them down. And then when God comes asking, hey, what happened? We puff our chests up and say, hey, look, I defended the gospel. And he's like, the gospel didn't need defending. I, I called you to love your brother. I called you to love your neighbor. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't they'll know you are my disciples by how well you theologically debate. 
They'll know you're my disciples by how well you defend the cross. You'll know my, you're my disciple by, by how well you tear down everyone in your path. No, they'll, they'll know by, by your love for one another. My heart burns for this, this city to know Jesus. And it's not going to happen unless we're united. I mean, how many times, I can't tell you how many times that you always hear comments of people saying like, oh yeah, Jesus I love, but it's people, his followers, right? I don't, I don't like them, right? Or, or it's just always, they look, they look at us and they see us ripping each other apart and say, why would I want to be a part of that? Why, why would I want to subject myself to that when I can go over here and even though it's of the world, they're still united. Wow. It might be for a wrong cause. It might be for something that we are absolutely like, that is not kingdom value. We don't agree with that. But they're like, what? But I found love. And I found love. I found acceptance. I found, I found something that I thought I was looking for. I don't want to be torn to shreds if I enter into that place. Right, we're like, we're like Peter, right? I love Peter. <laughs> He's so quick to just action and, and defense. You know, when they came to arrest Jesus, right, he whips out the sword and just hacks the guy's ear off. He's like, I did it, Lord. I defended the gospel. <laughs> and Jesus is like, Peter, what are you doing? You know, and he picks up the ear. He puts it back on, which you know had to just baffle Peter because he's like, Lord, you told me to buy the sword. What else is this for if not to cut this guy's ear off, you know, if to defend you? But we're so, we're so quick to do that. The second we feel we're being attacked or the second we feel that there is a difference that I can't for some reason reconcile in my mind with that person, it's I'm going to hack off your ear. And we do it to each other. That's the thing. It isn't that we're doing it to her like we get so bent out of shape for the world being the world. Like, how dare they? How dare they act like that? They don't know. And so we get to love them, but then when we do it to each other, it's like, oh. I mean, I would be considered, like, probably with some mental issues if I took out a knife and cut off my own ear. Right? We get sent to the, you'd be like, hey, you need to go. I know you see a therapist, but you might need some more medication or something in greater levels. And there's, we're going to check you into a clinic for a couple of days, you know. And meanwhile, I'm like Vincent Van Gogh with no ear and just. <laughs> we'll continue. <laughs> let's, let's go to, to 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 12. Right? For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. For if the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were hearing, what would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. And if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Wow. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, wow. that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. 
Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. That's all I got today, guys. That's no. <laughs> I mean, that speaks for itself, right? And it's just like, man, the way Paul just attacks things, you're just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Unity causes us to honor each other. And life, life flows through, through unity. Right? It's, I love, I love, I absolutely love the body of the church as the whole church. Like, I am fascinated by other denominations, um, mainly a lot of it because I've been through, I've been in a lot of different denominations. And there's, there's absolutely, there's some things where I'm like, dear Lord, this feels off, <laughs> you know, or this is extremely dry, and this just doesn't feel like it's with the Spirit. But there is so much beauty. There is beauty in every denomination. There absolutely is. It's literally like you're, you're taking just this facet of Jesus, and you're getting to turn it and look at all these different aspects of it. Are there, are there stains on it? Absolutely. Are there parts of it that just have it wrong, and, you know, there's hurts and whatnot? Absolutely. But there are, there are things that are so beautiful, and, and we're so quick to just cut off different denominations or to cut off parts of us, we're not realizing, like, man, that is actually, that's my arm. Yeah. And I wow. didn't realize it. Wow. It's, it's, let's say, let's say, we all got a stomach. The stomach, your stomach's like, man, I am so hungry. Give me some food. So, you know, your feet get up, they go to the fridge, your hands prepare the food, your mouth has to chew it, you swallow it down. And one day, let's just say the hands, feet, and mouth get together, and they're like, the stomach is so lazy. I'm sick and tired of feeding him. He can feed himself. So they refuse to feed the stomach. As time goes on, what happens? All of a sudden, those feet, those arms, they get a little weaker. Eventually, the person, they die. Because they refuse to feed the stomach. Because they refuse to give honor to this thing, <laughs> this organ, that, that actually was vital to their existence. Sometimes we think we can look at something and say, that's not right. That's lazy. We don't need that anymore. Let's get rid of that. And then all of a sudden you realize, why, why are we not thriving? Why is there no life? What is happening right now? Come on, man. Let's go. When, when I was at Bethel, I spent three years there. And I, I found throughout my journey of Bethel, I love Bethel, and it is an amazing house. And, and, but I, I found through my journey that there was really, by the time I hit my, my third year and I'm interning there, I found that there were things that I loved about Bethel, and there were things that I actually like, man, I, I have questions about why they do things that way. Or I wouldn't have made that decision. Or, you know what, actually, theologically, I actually think line up a little bit more this way than that way. But it didn't stop me from serving and honoring the house. Because I had planted myself and said, you know what, yeah, I have some questions here, but we're both going after the kingdom. We're, we're both going after Jesus, and I love what this house is about. And so I'm going to continue serving alongside you guys, despite what some of my differences might be, because we have this one core kingdom value that we're going after together, because we are one body. Well then, Kyle, what does unity look like? How do I walk in it? Yeah. I don't know. That's a mystery for Holy Spirit. No, no, no. I stopped my studying right there. I was, no. Um, let's go to Ephesians 4. Yeah, Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. It says, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, speak. this is Paul speaking, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all things and through all and in all. Yeah. Let's go to this, the, um, the Phillips translation. I, I, really, I really love the Phillips translation on this. It says, as God's prisoner, then I beg you to live lives worthy of your high calling, 
Accept life with humility and patience, making allowances for each other because you love each other. Make it your aim to be at one in the spirit, and you will inevitably be at peace with one another. You all belong to one body of which there is one spirit, just as you all experienced one calling to one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of us all, who is one over all, the one working through all, and the one living in all. What I love about this, what, what Paul says, is, is that phrase where he says, make sure to make every effort to maintain the spirit of unity, right? Make every effort to maintain this unity of the spirit. Now, he's not saying, hey, I need you to create unity. Come on. Yeah. We can't do that. Jesus created un- un- unity, right? And that's, that's, you read throughout Ephesians, that's what he's building up to this whole time. He's building up, it's like, look, Jesus created the unity we're all ready. We're, we're all one in Christ, right? We're, we're in union together. We're one member of one body. So now your job isn't to create unity, to but maintain it. Right. Recognize that it's already there and now protect it. Yep. Wow. Protect that unity. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go rapid fire through some, some verses here. Um, Colossians 3, 13 and 14 says, Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 1 Peter 3.8, finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Philippians 2.2, make my joy complete. And this is funny, you read it in context. He's like, listen. Help me. I want to be joyful. So make my joy complete. Bye. Be of the same mind. Having the same love. Being in full accord and of one mind. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be knit together in the same mind and the same purpose. You see, constantly throughout the epistles, throughout the letters, in the Bible, it's this plea to guys, stay together in unity. Don't allow these divisions, these things to come in and, and pull you guys apart. There's um, in, oh gosh, I think, it's, I think it's Philippians 4. I don't have this scripture, but I think it's Philippians 4 where, where Paul says like whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is kind of like think on these things. And at the beginning of it, he actually refers to these two people that are fighting, and he says, hey, you two, you've been having this disagreement. You know, you need to work things out. And it lays out how do you resolve this disagreement? Well, how do I resolve, you know, if I'm dealing with strife with Anthony all the time? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I need to think of whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is kind, whatever is gentle, of Anthony. And I got to train myself to be like, okay, that's what I'm going to focus on with Anthony right now. That's what I'm going to look for, right? I'm going to look for what's, what's kind of, and it makes it a whole lot easier then to be like, you know what? Yeah, we're, I love Anthony. We're, we're in union together here. We're going after the same thing. What was I thinking, you know, creating this huge argument over something so minuscule? I have two boys, Nolan and Caleb. Nolan is, uh, just turned eight a couple weeks ago, and Caleb is about to turn six in like, a little over a month, and dear Lord Jesus, it is chaos in our house so much. I left this morning, guys, and I mean, our couch is ripped apart, and there's like just towers of stuff everywhere, and you wake up to here and just like whining, crying, like, that's my cushion. I'm using that. No, I need that, and you're just fighting, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm about to throw out the couch. I'm going to throw out the whole couch. (laughs) I'm just like, ah. (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, which, well, I'm actually, you know, I'm going to use, use two things here. Sometimes I feel like throughout history, we see these beautiful moves of God, and I feel there's been times where the Lord has actually laid down a gift for us, and he said, hey, check this out, and we're like, this is amazing, and we're loving it, and next thing you know, we start fighting over it, and we start being divisive, and we start disagreeing it, and he's like, I'm going to take that back up. What happens with so many moves of God, so many revivals that we talk about? They end. Why do they end? Because there's disagreements and there's disunity. He's like, I gave you this beautiful gift. Go. And it always starts with like, yes, we're all after the same thing. And you see this beautiful move of God happening. And then disunity starts. 
there starts being breaks. And he's like, well, that's gonna, I'm going to have to end that. We're going to cut that off. Right? So when my boys, when, when they're fighting, sometimes I just want to take the couch and be like, it's gone, you know, or whatever toy, whatever it is. But I get to, as a, as a father, right, I get to help them navigate conflict. And I get to help them navigate this tension or this disunity. Because most of the times, man, they play amazing together. They're, they're great. Um, but there's these moments where it's like, that's mine. And the challenge of unity is that sometimes you might absolutely be 100% right. 100% right. But are you willing to say, I'm going to value the relationship over being right in this instance? Right? There's moments, it brings me so much joy when I see my kid, when I'll see like Nolan or Caleb, let's say, let's say it's Nolan, and I'll see Nolan, you know, Caleb took something of his, and Nolan's upset about it. And when Nolan says, it's okay. He can have it. You know, he can play with it for, for right now. He hits this moment where he just realizes, I'm 100% right. I am justified. I have all the scripture backing me that that is my Lego. Okay? All of heaven armies are at my dispense, ready to get my Lego back. And he says, you know what? He can play with the Lego right now. And then Caleb's so happy. He gets to do it. And he, what? Caleb, Caleb's a little ADHD. He'll be like five minutes. He's like, all right, I'm done, you know, here. And all of that, all we had this whole argument over that. But it brings me so much joy to see Nolan say, hey, you know what? I'm going to choose the relationship over being right. And it goes vice versa when, when Caleb does it. And I always celebrate it with him. I'm like, God, thank you. You made such a good choice. And, you, you know, you hype him up. And, and because there's this fight for, for unity, I don't have to be right all the time. I mean, I am, but I don't have to be, okay? I don't have to let you know that I'm right all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I wanna end with, with this. Who's ever heard of um, John Wesley and George Whitfield, right? Amazing preachers of the gospel, part of the Great Awakenings. Uh, John Wesley, we have the whole Methodist uh, denomination from... And John Wesley and George Whitfield were actually, uh, they went to Oxford together. They were friends growing up in the ministry, and slowly over time, their theological beliefs started to differ. John Wesley was very, um, more in like the Arminianism camp, right, free will, and, and George Whitfield was Calvinist, like we're, we're predestined. And, and so they had these, these tensions, and um, there was this, this letter if someone wants to hear this story too, Tisha actually posted it on her Instagram of Bill actually sharing this. But um, there's this letter that John Wesley wrote George Whitfield, and in it he says, "Make sure I get it. I get it right. We loved more when we knew less. We loved more when we knew less. It was so much easier for them to find unity." when they had less of their, like, theological or political or whatever things, whatever would cause disagreement, it was like, we, it was easier for us to love. Now, it doesn't mean that they stopped loving each other, right? They found ways to say, hey, unity is vital. Unity is valuable to the Father. It's, there's a cost to it, and so I need to be able to lay down my right to be right, right? I need to be able to lay that down because the thing that Jesus required isn't that I'm right, it's, it's that I would love, right? It's that I would be in union with, with my brethren. And so they would work at, at this. And, and the beautiful thing is, so there, there were, right, it, it's, it raises the question of, am I willing to lay down my values to go after what he values? Yeah, that's good. Wow. Right? Sometimes it, it, it's just, man, like, I'm, I'm justified in this, but the Lord's not on that. He's, he's on union right now. And am I willing to say, okay, I'm going to walk in unity, and I'm going to fight for peace and maintain harmony between me and my brother instead of creating strife? There was a, um, a follower of John Wesley who... Um, again, right, there's, there's strife between these two camps. They don't always get along. And, and he says, he goes to Wesley, and he, he says, hey, 
we're not going to see George Whitfield in heaven, are we? Oh, I don't know. Was he predestined? No. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and John Wesley's reply, this is where you capture his heart for unity. He says, I fear not, for he will be far too closer to the throne. And we will be so far back that we will not be able to see him in the light of the God's glory. Even in the disagreements, he is able to say, I still honor what this man has done for the gospel. He is still my brother. He is still my friend. What he has done, he will be so much closer to the throne than I. And when George Whitfield passed, John Wesley did his memorial services. Wow. Right? It's, it's, it's like taking the person that you've disagreed the most with, and you're like, I'm going to honor this person in, in their death. Right? It's, it's something that, that I've seen Bill Johnson do so well. Right? There was, there was a, a, a time when he was in Weaverville, and... Um, this man that was disgruntled with him has, had disagreements. They were, just did not like Bill. Literally interrupts the, the message, comes storming down the front, yelling, screaming at, at Bill. And Bill invites him up, sits him down. He goes backstage, and he comes back with a bowl of water and a towel and washed his feet. And just saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that what I've said hurt you. I'm so sorry. This and just, just apologized and just loved on the man. Bill chose, hey, I, most likely Bill was right. Right? I mean, it's, it's Bill. And he's like the most gentle, loving man, grandpa, you will ever find. And, and here he is saying, you know what? I'm just going to love this man right here. I'm going to wash his feet. Right? You see, um, Graham Cook has stories of these guys that used to follow him around just to, just to wreak havoc and write up stories about him, about how false he is and whatnot. And he was just like, God, get rid of them. And the Lord's like, why? You know, love them. There's blessings when they curse you. Go for it. And so he started getting excited. He started, like, saving seats for them and starts, you know, being, like, meeting them and thanking them for coming to his conferences. And, and so there's this, there's this call as we, are, as we are one body to truly be one body. And so much of the world today, it's all about how we can divide. I mean, you, golly, you take a, just a dollop of the political world and it is all, it's just division. That's all it is. Whose camp are you in? It's us versus them. Us versus them. Us versus them. Us from everywhere you look. Every aspect of culture is us versus them. And Jesus is like, man, it's just us. Right? Can we just learn to love each other? Can we learn to, to be in unity? Because unity is what's actually going to attract the world to us. I wanna, I'm going to close with, with this. I'm just going to read two scriptures, and that's, that's going to be it. Um, and take them as kind of like little um, benedictions or, or prayers over you guys right now. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus and of the love of God and of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Key word there that I want to focus on is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that union. And then reading a, a bigger passage of the Philippians 2, it says, If then there's any comfort in Christ, any cons consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, any tender affection and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full of cord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard each other as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others, and let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let's stand real quick. I'm just going to pray, bless you guys, and then we'll, we'll be on our way. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that together with you we've been brought into the unity of the Spirit. We thank you that we are members of one body. Lord, we thank you for every aspect, for every fiber, for every tissue, for every organ, for every ligament, for every joint, every, every vein, every blood vessel, every part that makes up your body, Lord, every single member. We thank you and we honor them, Lord. And would you 
Grant us the grace of unity. Would you grant us the ability to value relationship over the need to be right? Would you grant us the, the ability to see everyone as, as our brothers? Would you, would you stop us from being so quick to, to slay our brother, Lord? Would you, would, you, um, would you just grant us a greater awareness of our unity as one body? Would you grant us a greater revelation of your love towards each other, Lord? Would, we, would you make us one so that the world would know you. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you're always active, that you're always moving. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have brought us into this unity. And Lord, would you ever increase it? In Jesus' name.